Okay. We are reading from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 19, from verse 28 to 30. Today is Sunday, 23rd September, 2018. The Gospel according to John, chapter 19, verse 28 to 30. Just a few verses. And it reads, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Father, we thank you for your word. The entrance of your word brings light. Lord, Holy Spirit, you are the God of light. You are the God of wisdom, God of understanding. Bring light unto this word, O oh Lord. Give us an understanding of your word. The entrance of your word brings light. You are the God that loves us more than we know, that wants better things for us than we even know how to ask. So, Lord, let your perfect will be done for us today. Reveal your word to us and help us to understand. And, and you say your, the seed is the word. But help us to plant this seed and let it grow into a mighty tree to the glory of your name. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Okay. I welcome you. Today is Sunday, 23rd of September, like I said, 2018. And the title of our message today is, The Cross Has the Final Word. The Cross Has the Final Word. Now you can, you, you, for your understanding, you can also say, The Cross Says It All. The Cross Says It All. The Cross Has the Final Word. Nothing else can be said after the Cross. The Cross Says It All. Like we just read, John chapter 19, in verse 30. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. It is finished because nothing can come after that. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. The New Living Translation says, he bowed his head and released his spirit. He bowed his head and released his spirit. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. You see, his spirit wasn't taken. He gave it up. He released it. It was a calculated release. It wasn't a tormented death. It wasn't a fearful death. It was task or mission accomplished. That's why he could still speak. Some people after all that, they would have died long before. The case of Jesus was different. He had a mission to accomplish and he accomplished it and that's why he said, it is finished. He said, I came and I've done it. And it's done. The cross says it all. That's the final word. Nothing else can be done after that. Mission accomplished. He did it gracefully and graciously. He did it in the attitude of a king. He said, it is finished. 
and he bowed his head. Really with attitude. It's like I've done it. He bowed his head and he released his spirit. He let himself go. Nobody forced his life out of his hand. Nobody did anything. Jesus let go. He, he gave himself up because of you and me. It was an executive decision to release his spirit. He didn't just panic and say, oh, I'm going to die now. No, 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 no. No, no, no. He declared, it is finished. I've come, I've done it. Now, Okay? Remember he had work to do. There was no panic. It was calculated. As he released his spirit on earth, he appeared somewhere else. He had work to do in Satan's prison where he kept those who disobeyed God during the flood of Noah. We can see that in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 to 22. He closed the chapter in one realm and continued his work in another realm. Even today, without his intercession, none of us would be here. He is still doing that work for you and me. God cannot die. To the eye of the unbeliever, they saw a dead man on the cross. But Jesus, with attitude, said, it is finished. And, okay, let me leave this world. Let me go into the next. It was calculated. It was graceful. He was, it, he was gracious in all that he's doing. He, he, it, he was the king of all kings and has always been the king of all kings so he knew exactly what he was doing. And that is why even today, right now as we speak, he is still doing the work. He's interceding for us, praying, Father, don't let that one that I died for go to that prison of hell anymore. I went, I released those who were there, and now these ones don't need to go there. And all we can ever, ever say is, Lord Jesus, thank you for your prayer for me. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are praying for me right now. Where would I be without you? Where would I be without your prayer? You see, we think we, we know too much. We are doing too much. We are too cool. We are too this. But Without the prayer of Jesus, where would we be? What do we know that the Holy Spirit has not taught us? Jesus is still speaking on our behalf today. As he spoke on the cross. Declaring that his mission was accomplished. He's still saying, Father, I died for that one. He's still pleading on our behalf. Our daily sin, our daily disobedience, our daily backsliding, our whatever we do. Jesus is still gracious. The cross stands strong and the cross speaks loudly and clearly. It is finished. The cross has the final word. Jesus was lifted up on that cross so that all eyes can look up and see him. It wasn't, his death wasn't some hidden thing. No, it wasn't. It was clear. All eyes could see. And because this is what the prophets had already uh, uh, spoke about, they shall look on him whom they pierce. If you cannot look on him who, who was pierced, where is your salvation? That's Zechariah chapter 12 verse 10. 
And if you, if you look at that, John chapter 19, verse 37. John, the same 19 that we read, verse 37. And again, another scripture. Okay, let, yeah, for, for, for the sake of understanding, let's start from verse 35. And he who has seen has testified that John who is writing. He said he saw these things with his own eyes. And he's testifying. And his testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth so that you may believe. John saw and wrote it down. He saw it with his eyes and he's making a testimony. And he's saying this testimony is true so that you may believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. First of all, not one of his bones shall be broken. That's what the prophet said before. Verse 37, and again another scripture. To Jesus, the whole Bible is the story of one man. The whole Bible is the story of Jesus. Everything that was prophesied concerning him. They shall look on him whom they have pierced. And even if you read on how Joseph of Arimathea came and took his body, it was also written, he, he will be buried among the rich. This was a rich man, he had a tomb, nobody had ever lighted it. He, because he believed in Jesus, he took Jesus to his tomb. Every, everything that was prophesied concerning Jesus, and this was hundreds of years before Jesus even came physically to the earth. That's why when he came, he, he fulfilled the scriptures and he said, it is finished. If you read that Zechariah chapter 13, verse 6 to 9, it, you know, other, other uh, uh, scriptures that were fulfilled. I don't think I want to go into them individually, but I can just read that quickly. Um, Zechariah chapter 13, okay, 12, I said 12 verse 10 before. And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. So that was Zechariah prophesying. Then verse 18 from verse 6. And one will say to him, what are these wounds between your arms? How did Zechariah know? Because what the Spirit tells you is truer than what you see with your physical eyes. What are these wounds between your arms? Then he will answer, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. I went to help my friends and all they did was pierce me. I went to my own. My own did not recognize me. Instead, they wounded me. That's why I have those wounds. Verse 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is my companion, says the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. That's Jesus quoted that as well. Then I will turn my hand against the little ones. Because when the master is gone, the little ones are scattered. And it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, that two-thirds in it shall be cut off and die, but one-third shall be left in it. Verse 9, I will bring the one-third through the fire, will refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, this is my people. And each one, each 
individual one of the one third, the selected few, each one will say, the Lord is my God. But you cannot say that until you've gone through fire, like silver and gold, until you've been tested. And it goes on to, you know, also more prophecies. John chapter 3 from verse 14. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so also the Son of Man was lifted up. The cross stands as a symbol of truth, declaring to the world that one king died for his subjects. He did not die and remain dead. No, he died to the physical eye, but was made alive in the spirit or raised to life in the spirit. The cross speaks the final word to the inhabitants of this earth, but how many people are seeing it? The cross speaks because a sinless man had to die for sinners. That's what the Bible says. The, sin, uh, the sinless dying for sinners. Let's see if I can. That was, I'm, 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 read, I'm quoting from First Peter 3, from verse... From verse 18, I would say, Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners. To bring you safely home to God. That's why Jesus hung on that cross and died. So that you and I could be brought home safely to God. He didn't die for his sin. He died for your sin and my sin. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the spirit. 1 Peter 3, verse 18, I'm reading. He suffered physical death. So the Bible makes you understand that was just for the physical eye to see. He suffered, 1 Peter 3, verse 18, I just read. Christ suffered for our sins, once for all time. That's why I said the, the cross says it all. At the cross, he said it's finished. So it's once for all time. He never sinned because even the people that said, crucify him, crucify him. When Pilate said, what has this man really done? Nobody could say anything. Oh, he said he's the son of God. Are you not a child of God? Am I not a child of God? So what's, what's wrong with saying I'm a child of God? He suffered physical death, only physical death. But he was raised to life in the spirit. To the world, they saw a dead man. But God, my God, doesn't die. Amen? My God does not die. So as he left this world, he breathed and gave up his spirit. He went straight to help. He continued the work in another realm. Because if he doesn't do that, you and I will perish. But he died so that he can take us home to daddy. That's what the Bible says. But he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. I'm re that's the uh, NTL version. One king died for his subjects. Other kings send their subjects to war and they can die. And we remember when we read about David and, and his uh, 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 soldiers, when, when Absalom was, was pursuing him and he wanted to go and fight. The, the people said, no, you can't come and fight because you are worth more than 10,000 of us. So they recognized that. But Jesus is not that stay-home king. 
he went himself and did the job and said, it is finished. He did not die and remain dead. No, he died to the physical eye but was made alive in the spirit. The cross spoke that final word to the inhabitants of the earth so that we can have him to look unto. Him that was pierced, they shall look unto him whom they pierced. He did not die to condemn sinners. He died to atone for your sin and my sin. The death of Jesus didn't, didn't, didn't say, aha, uh -huh, see what you guys did, for, did to me, even when I came to love you. No, he died to atone that he might bring us safely back home to God. His death was an atoning death. His blood, his, the blood, his blood atones for our sins, washes our sins, so that he can bring us perfectly and pure back to the Father who loved us so much that he gave his only begotten Son. John chapter 3 verse 16. The cross has the final word, and that's why we must look unto the cross. He who has ears, let him hear. Only one man died for others. When you and I die, we die for ourselves. If you, if you say, oh, I'll die for my children, I'll die for my husband, I'll die for my... It's a lie. It's a lie. You die, you perish in your own sin. Because your blood cannot atone for their blood. If somebody kills you when you are good, even your blood will cry out from the ground to God and God will avenge for you. So when you die, you die for yourself. Only Jesus died and carried the sin of the world. And that's why even at that very last moment, because he is God, he had the, the power to declare it is finished. It was a, a, a calculated experience. Yes, hurtful, painful. Yes, he had to die for all your nonsense and my nonsense. So it was painful to the physical. But he bore it because he wasn't physical. That's why we have to learn to leave the physical and start to depend on the spiritual. The cross is not there to condemn, it's there to atone. The cross tells the story of redemption. Look to me and be saved. That's what Jesus says. He doesn't say look to me and be condemned. Look to me and be saved. You do not need to die in your sin. I have paid the price of your sin in full. Like I said last time, he paid it in cash. It was a cash down transaction. He didn't pay with credit card that will bounce. He didn't pay with check that will bounce. He paid it cash down. So the devil has no unsettled claims against you. When he comes and, and, and accuses you, you tell him, you know what? Yes, I have sinned, but Jesus has paid, for the, paid the price of my sin. And he is my Lord. So I answer to him, not to you. But what do we do? We stand and have discussion with the devil. And we think we are clever. And he'll just crush us with, with his tiny finger. You have no discussion with the devil. You tell him, go and talk to my master. I have given my life to Jesus. Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. If you are crucified, why are you still talking? You are a dead man. So let it be. What explanations have you got to give? The devil is not looking for your explanation. He's looking for you to make, a, make an error, make a mistake, so that he can use it against you and accuse you even more. The cross has the final word. And we should imitate Jesus. Jesus, we thank you that you finished it for me. Thank you, Jesus, that you finished this work for me. Where would I be without you? The cross has the final word because it drips with that message of salvation. 
you don't have to pay the price. You just follow Jesus. You are, you are paying the price is what Jesus said to us last Sunday, Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Deny yourself. That, that's why Paul said, I have been crucified. So you are dead to the world. You are dead to the flesh. Deny yourself. Pick up your cross daily and follow me. That is your own part of the deal. In order to stay safe, just go on the side of Jesus. Look unto me and be saved. Deny yourself, deny the flesh, all the things that we run after, that we already know are perishable. But why do we run after them so much? Because we have no understanding of eternal things. And eternal things are more valuable because they stand forever. And Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away. Look at the heavens and the earth that he created. He said, they'll pass away, but my word shall not pass. And we know it. All that we see now, one day it will be rolled off. And then a new heaven will come down to a new earth. And that will be immortal. So let us remember today, yes, it is the cross that has the final word. The cross has the final word. That's why we should listen well to what Zechariah said in chapter 13 from verse 7 to verse 9. Jesus died and expects you to leave all and follow him. We, we touched on the career earlier, isn't it? Let's go back there. The career verse 13. Because this is how to surrender. Not trying to do your own thing. But do it to the glory of God. Come on, the career. <clears throat> Chapter thirteen, we are we'll look at from verse seven. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, the man who is my partner, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Strike down the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered, and I will turn against the lambs. Okay? So you have to know, when we read in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Do you really believe it? We have one shepherd who will not let us want. But in this time, he, he had to die for us. And that's what Zechariah was talking about. And because of what people see with their eyes and believe, the Bible says two-thirds of the people in the land will be cut off and die. Because when Jesus was alive and strong, everybody said, I'll die for you. Oh, wherever you go, I go. But when they saw him being beaten, how many were left? Two thirds were gone. That's why Jesus says that the, the path that leads to eternal life is a very narrow path. Only a few find it. So it's time to make up our minds. Do we want to go with the masses or do we want to choose this? The, small and narrow part. Two thirds were gone. It even happened in heaven. One third of all the angels followed Satan. So I'm reading from Zechariah chapter 13. Two thirds of the people in the land will be cut off and die, says the Lord, but one third will be left in the land. God always has a remnant. And I want to be one of those remnants in Jesus' name. 
I will bring that group, that one third, I will bring them through the fire. So you have to be ready. I'll bring them through the fire and make them pure. So your fire time is not crucifixion time, it's purification time. Your fire, when you are the remnant, your fire time is not crucifixion, it's purification. I will make them pure. I will refine them like silver and purify them like gold. They will call on my name. See, you have access when you go through it. You have access. You are positioned in a, in a place that others will, will give up their arms to be. They will call on my name and I will answer them. They will say, uh, no, I will say, these are my people. So you have acknowledgement with God. God acknowledges you because you have been through thick and thin with him. So he will say, even we read that in Psalm 91, because they know my name, I will protect them. I will say, these are my people and they will say, the Lord is our God. They, every one of them individually, you have that individual access to God. They will call on my name, I will answer them. I will say, this is my people. And each one, each one individually will say, the Lord is my God. So you have that personal reward for going through that purification time. You have that personal reward for going through that fire. You have that access, personal access to the most high God. And that access doesn't come cheap. You have to go through the fire. You have to deny yourself and pick up your cross daily and follow him. Because he is a God that says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. He is your keeper. He is your salvation. He is your shepherd. He is your redeemer. Jesus is your managing director. He makes executive decisions on your behalf. He never lets you down. He is a reliable God. And we read today Psalm 146. If you go back to that Psalm 146 from verse 3. He's warning you. He said, do not put your trust in princes. Don't put your trust in human beings. They will fail you. Don't hear what they say today. Oh, I'll die for you. And then you, you, you follow them. They will fail you. The God that we worship gives us instructions and he is very clear. The cross, the, the message of the cross is very, very clear. God doesn't hide if you seek him. He says, when you seek me, you'll find me. Do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man in whom there is no help. His spirit departs. You see, when the spirit of Jesus departed, he, he kept going. But this one, Psalm 146 verse 4, when his, this human being spirit departs, he returns to his earth. In that very day, his plans perish. So everything he promised you is gone. Everything he said is gone. But the word of the Lord stands forever. Verse 5. Happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help. And not the one who has human beings for his help. Whose hope? is in the Lord his God, the God who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps truth forever. His word never fails. Who executes justice. That's why I say Jesus is your managing director. He makes executive decisions on your behalf. He executes justice for the oppressed. So he steps in. 
like we talked about Laban and Jacob earlier. He steps in when, when the enemy wants to oppress you. He gives food to the hungry. The Lord gives freedom to the prisoners. That's what Jesus did to the prisoners of the flood of Noah. He is the same yesterday. He is the same today. He, he is the same forever. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. He's a miracle worker. The Lord raises those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. He relieves the fatherless and widow. So he takes care of those who are in need. But the way of the wicked, he turns upside down. That's the word of God. He turns the way of those who don't love him. He turns their way. Their way is upside down anyway because they don't have the light of God to see. So their plans will fail in Jesus' name. The Lord shall reign forever. Your God, O Zion. Your God, O minister of the living Jesus. Your God shall reign forever to all generations. Praise the Lord. Amen. So that is who we serve. He turns things around. He turns situations around for your good. What the enemy meant for evil, he turns it for good. He frustrates the plan of the wicked concerning you, but establishes you more than you can imagine. May the Lord establish the work of our hands for his glory in the name of Jesus. He surrounds you and me with favor as though it were a shield. So when the favor of God is on you, you will flourish wherever you go. People will see it, whatever you do, as long as you do it in his way for his glory. He looks with pity on you. He forgives your iniquities, like Psalm 103 says. He favors you with access. That's the most important thing. He opens doors for you where others cannot enter. Because he is the father of orphans. He is the husband of widows. He is the helper of the oppressed. He provides for the needy. He is the helper of the poor. He is our God. And the cross makes all this possible. Because the cross has the final word. And may that be our word for today. For his glory. In Jesus name. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you came to your own and your own did not recognize you, yet you did not give up. You were diligent to the end. Lord, teach us diligence in your service in the name of Jesus. Father, help us, O Lord, because it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Holy Spirit, we need your assistance. We need your strength. We need your spirit to sustain us, O oh Lord. Give us, O oh Lord, that spirit of, of prayer and supplication. Help us, O oh Lord, to remain standing even when the wind blows, O oh Lord, because you are the karma of the wind. And when we have put our trust in you, and when we have died and we have become one in you, then no wave, no, no, no head, head, earthquake can shake us. So, Lord, we thank you for revealing these things to us. Thank you for drawing us to your side. Thank you for opening our, our eyes to the secrets of the kingdom because your word said it has been given to you to know the secrets of the mysteries of the kingdom. Lord, we thank you for this privilege. We thank you for this access that wherever we go, when others are told, step aside, please, that they, they open the door for us and say, oh no, you can go. We can go. Because we have the name of Jesus. Jesus says, go in my name. So Lord, we will go to the ends of the world with your name. And we will do everything that you sent us into this world to do at a time like this. And all the glory, all the honor, all the adoration will be to you and you alone. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen. Amen.